Hello and welcome back to the Digital Health and Wearables series. Today I have another magnificent guest, leader and episode for you. But before I go ahead, let me uh, remind you to subscribe to the channel. Also share with your communities in healthcare, your connections, your colleagues and anyone interested in this type of content. Uh, also let me acknowledge our industry partners, the digital health platform Clinitouch V and our industry partner, Isaac Kerr. But today gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Janak gunati Lek. He is the head of healthcare analytics at KPMG UK and an author. Dr. Janak, how are you? Good, thank you. Hi, how are you, Joe? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for uh, accepting my invite and nice to see you. And thanks for inviting me. It's uh, great to be here. Brilliant. And today we are here to discuss artificial intelligence AI in healthcare. And the first question that I have for you, Janak, is how can AI help improve healthcare? Yeah. Um, so, Vinod Koshla, who um, co founded Sun Microsystems uh, back in 1982, um, did a uh, was speaking at a conference um, back in 2012 and he made a very controversial statement which is uh, to a room full of doctors he basically said machines will replace 80 percent of doctors in a healthcare future that will be driven by entrepreneurs not medical professionals and as you can imagine obviously uh, a lot of people in that room were not happy with that statement but if you actually take the um the fact around the 80 percent of doctors and see where things are now um, in real life, actually, although um, the, there has been much progress with AI, the results have been not that impressive. And obviously, AI is nowhere near replacing 80% of doctors. Mm. And if you look at some of the publications um, looking at studies within AI, you see a lot of the studies are retrospective and a lot of the studies are quite small scale and of uh, proof of concept solutions. So. And does that mean that um, there isn't any potential for AI in uh, healthcare? No, that, I, I don't believe so. Um, I don't think it will replace 80% um, of doctors or any doctors anytime soon, but I think there is potential. So um, I have um, this approach of thinking about where the potential of AI might be. So I kind of look at um, it across two areas. Um, one is um, kind of the specific um, areas of healthcare. So for example, uh, whether it's uh, non-clinical back office type functions or whether it's um, in the area of um, actual delivery of healthcare, so it's on the front line. And the third area is somewhere in between, which is around sort of increasing productivity. Um, and then the kind of other lens I apply is uh, the kind of four stages of the patient journey. So starting from planning uh, to prevention, to delivery of care and the ongoing management of um, patient care delivery. So when you put those two things together, you almost get a grid. And so, for example, if you look in the box that um, connects prevention and uh, non-clinical back office functions, you get population health, which might, which is a, you know, really good area where AI can um, really add some value. Or another example might be if you look at the prevention and the enhancing care delivery, you might be looking at areas where AI could um, prevent avoidable errors or um, adverse drug effects. So just a useful way of thinking about all the different areas where um, AI can um, add value. Now, the reality is uh, for AI to really uh, mature and, and start to do the best it can, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a gradual process. I think we're going to see some areas, for example, where it might be um, kind of something like radiology, where there's a lot of digitized data available and the and of force that's quite used to using digital um, solutions. Uh, for example, there's been a recent uh, framework around uh, AI applications within stroke um, in England, which is a good progress um, towards that goal. I think there's a lot of untapped potential in the back office areas as well, where there can be a lot of AI applied to help improve processes or, or deliver efficiencies uh, to help 
the NHS and other healthcare systems overcome some of the operational challenges it says. I think it's going to take a little bit more time uh, for AI to be widespread in some of the more uh, other wider clinical areas. And I think there's going to be a number of things that needs to happen to make that work, uh, which we can talk about in a bit. Yeah, sure. Th thank you so much. I really uh, I like that, that controversial statement. So the doctors and clinicians can be reassured that they're not going to be replaced sometime soon, right? 80%. <laughs> I, like, I like that statement. Uh, thank you so much for those amazing insights, especially the four stages of the patient journey where AI can add value and also run repetitive tasks and everything. And thanks for these magnificent insights. And the second question that I have for you is what are the main challenges? Yeah, um, so I think um, to answer this question, I kind of sometimes um, like to look outside healthcare first and, and look at um, some of the industries and companies that are using AI well. So, for example, if you look at companies such as Netflix or, or Uber or Amazon, uh, they're doing some um, really good applications of AI, whether it's kind of personalizing recommendations or making operations, their own operations uh, more efficient or making it easier for the customer to do something using uh, their solutions. So just to think about like, why is it working well for them? I think firstly, they have um, access to a large amount of data, right? Hundreds of millions of users. And, and some of the, a lot of the data comes from a small number of sources where those particular companies have a lot more control over the data sources. So they've got access to large data sets, decent quality, but obviously they also have invested huge amounts of money in actually building underlying infrastructure and, and platforms that actually helps them collect the data, make sure it's uh, of good data quality and makes it easier for their internal teams to use that data and build uh, tools on top of. Secondly, I think if you look at um, all of those applications, they, they're using AI to solve real problems. Uh, and they're using uh, doing that in a way that actually uh, is seamlessly integrated into the user journey. So people are not thinking, oh, I'm using AI, but it just happens in the background and it, it, it um, makes it easier for them to do whatever they were trying to do or, or gives them some unique insight that wouldn't have been otherwise available. And the third thing is because of the industries and, and the applications that we've just talked about, there, there is room for error. By which I mean, you know, if Netflix makes you a recommendation for uh, the next movie you should watch, you know, you may not you may not um, agree with that, or you might think, oh, that's not for me. But that's not going to be a huge. Um, it's not going to have a huge impact for either for yourself or for Netflix. Mm -hmm. So, when you sort of translate that into healthcare, I mean, healthcare is a deeply personal and important things to. Um, you know, all of us. So when it comes to matters relating to either your own health or, or to the health of somebody you, you love, the stakes are much higher, you know, that it, this is, it's a lot different to a movie recommendation. So I think what that means is um, there are a number of um, challenges when it comes to AI in healthcare. And I like to think of um, the challenges within within three buckets. So the first bucket is, is around people. Um, firstly, around having the trust and confidence in the uh, solutions um, <clears throat> within the AI space. And secondly, also uh, having the, the right knowledge and skills to understand uh, what, what AI can and can't do and, and how best to utilize that um, within the healthcare context. And I think the third thing, uh, we all know how um, busy um, healthcare professionals, clinicians are, and, and all the operational challenges that healthcare systems are facing now. And to really make AI a success, you need time from um, the experts, the clinicians, the people working on the ground. And I think it's at the moment, it's quite hard for them to um, dedicate the time that's needed and also have the headspace to fully engage with um, AI solutions. The second um, bucket is around systems, uh, by which I mean the, the environment, the, the the processes and sort of clinical workflows and, and the kind of overall organizational structures into which AI solutions are deployed within healthcare. So one of the key things within this bucket is around um, narrow focus. So, so AI is very good um, and at sort of doing very specific things. So for example, it might be looking at looking for a bleed on a MRI scan of, of the brain, for example. But it's not so good at 
other things ar around that, whereas a human would be able to sort of have a view on not just that one specific thing, but things around it, which means that um, it's sometimes hard to um, deploy AI in a situation because you can't just be looking out for only one that one thing, and you might then have to think about what other solutions you need to bring together, which always makes it a little bit more complicated. The other big thing, uh, and I'm sure you know you you know a lot about this, is is more around just digital health, and and you know it's not an AI specific thing, but the funding um, mechanisms and and how you buy things and how you define the value of of a digital health solution, and and, and AI is no different, is quite tricky, right? So. Um, it often becomes quite difficult to understand like how to pay for it, how to buy it, as well as AI being slightly different in the sense that um, there is a lot of experimentation to, to happen uh, in, in order to develop some of these algorithms to, to a stage where it can be uh, deployed. So, so funding can, can often be a challenge in developing these solutions. The third bucket is around technology. So, for example, we already talked about the the access to data. So, um, a lot of the time, I find that um, innovators are struggling to get access to um, enough data or data of um, sort of adequate quality that allows them to um, develop the solutions that they would like to do. And this leads to problems around bias or or um, uh, solutions that can work within one population or one setting but can't really be generalized or, or taken and, and work within a, a, another context. And the other thing that um, sometimes we don't talk as much about is, is almost some of the the, the risks around um, sort of unethical actors, whether that's kind of cybersecurity related risk or or even using AI to uh, potentially manipulate some of the underlying data, uh, you know, where we've seen things like deep fakes, et cetera, in the media, there have been reports of, of how that can, that sort of um, technology can be used to uh, manipulate uh, medical imaging, et cetera. So, so these are some of the, some of the challenges that um, innovators face uh, when, when they're talking about AI solutions in healthcare. Brilliant. Jenna, th thank you. Thank you so much. That's a very comprehensive overview. And, you are very right. Healthcare is an industry like no other. The risk associated, I mean, this at the end of the day, is people's lives. Yeah? A mistake is not the same thing uh, in another industry, which can be costly, but not in terms of like putting a life in, um, uh, in fret. And I like these three buckets that you uh, talked about. So people, more processes, and then the technology, the technology side, certainly a lot of... Uh, uh different segmented challenges there too. so thank you so much for that the third and last question for you is how can we do things better yeah no thank you um yeah so i think um my sort of thinking on this is that we need a a more holistic approach which takes into account you know some of the challenges we talked about it as, as well as some of the things that have worked uh, well in other industries so i think of it um as a as an approach with kind of three key components, uh, the first component is is really important, and and it's 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 quite a simple one, and um, which is the fact that whatever you're trying to do must address a real problem. Uh, by which I mean, you know, um, we should always start with trying to understand, okay, what, what are we trying to solve? You know, is this a real problem? Have we talked to um, people that work in healthcare? Have we talked to clinicians? Have we understood, oh yes, this is a problem that that's actually worth solving rather than saying, oh, you know, I've got this really cool technology or I've got this really clever model. Let's go and try and find something that it, it might be able to solve. So I think the first thing is to really always, always just start with the solution. I think sometimes, you know, AI may not be the answer, right? Um, and technology might not be the answer. So I think that we always need to sort, start with the problem and, and work through that process. The second thing is around um, what I call almost, almost a, a roadmap, right? Which, which takes into account uh, two things. One is the, um, the the kind of life cycle of developing AI solutions. So that's everything from identifying the right problem, as we've talked about before, to designing it with uh, involving the right people, uh, developing a kind of a safe, effective, and scalable solution, implementing it, which would include potentially things like pilots, evaluations, and and scaling that up, and then 
after the implementation, uh, continually monitoring and improving it to make sure that we realize the benefits as well as we continue to be compliant with the various regulations. So on the top almost you have um, the the various stages of, of the life cycle of developing something. And then the other, other lens we need to apply when we're thinking about a roadmap is the different stakeholders that are involved. So uh, we've already talked about innovators, you know, founders, um, tech companies that actually um, develop the solution. Then there are hospitals, um, management, healthcare systems that actually buy this solution. There are funders, whether that's uh, kind of public sector funders like uh, we have in the UK, or it could be private investors, angel investors, VCs that invest in these companies that are developing products. Um, end users, whether that's patients or um, clinicians um, or other um, healthcare workforce that use the product. And of course, regulators that you know have an interest in making sure these products are safe. So what this means is when you again, when you kind of put this together in almost a grid, depending on what stage you are, um, there are things um, that individual stakeholders need to do. And that and the other important thing is they need to work together. So for example, if, if you're an innovator and you're in the design phase, one of the key priorities might be that you work with um, the health operators and end users to really um, develop and refine a value proposition for the solution. Um, so that, you know, they, that then helps you take it to the next level, um, get buy-in, get funding and realize the benefits. So the third, element of uh, the approach I, I, I want to articulate is, is around enablers. Um, and those enablers could be at an organizational level or could be a regional or national level. So by by enablers, I mean things that are not necessarily directly um, within your control, but needs uh, support from um, a, a wider, a, a more kind of a ecosystem level or, or, or a wider national policy level, which means that, you know, sometimes you might be doing everything that you should be doing uh, and you're working with the right people, but if there are some of these enablers, so these enablers um, could be things like um, data, for example, you know, having good access to data and then some of the frameworks to make sure that um, the data can be shared in the right way. Uh, it could be um, things like uh, we talked about the funding mechanism and procurement mechanisms, uh, those things uh, being in place, uh, validation frameworks, etc., which, you know, needs to be uh, done independently, but those being in place so that you, you can take your product through that process. And also we talked about things like um, staff um, and not having the time and headspace. So how, how do we solve that problem? You know, as, as a founder, you can't solve that. that that's something that that needs to be done at a system level. So I think these are a, a number of different things that needs to be um, thought about more collectively and at a, at a higher level to ensure that individuals um, trying to develop these solutions and, and systems and end users that are trying to use these systems um, basically have what they need, the support and, and the underlying infrastructure and support so that they can actually um, work together to um, make AI solutions in healthcare a success. Brilliant. Uh, Jenna, thank you so much. I mean, this is really helpful for, and thank you for highlighting these good practices, if you like, and things to look out for. So the first item that you mentioned was looking around the solution. Usually most people start with the technology and with the product. This is the great product that we have, and sometimes the application is not the desired. And also the stakeholders that you mentioned, and the third point, the enables. Th thank you so much. Janak, look, we come to the end of the interview. I appreciate your time, your expertise. Thanks for accepting the invite. I don't have more questions, but I finish all my episodes in a peculiar way. It's not a question as such, but it's called one minute of fame. And you can mention anything, professional life, your achievements, um, uh, 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 family life, anything whatsoever, over to you. I know one thing that I really want to give you a big mention. You probably uh, also want to mention that, but... Over to you to round up uh, one minute of fame. 
Um, thanks, Joel. Uh, yeah, so um, I think uh, I've been doing a lot of thinking around uh, AI and healthcare, and one of the things I've done recently is uh, write a book about um, uh, trying to share my thoughts on the subject. Uh, it's called um, Artificial, Artificial Intelligence in Healthcare Unlocking its Potential. So if any of these things are of interest uh, to you, it's um, you know you might want to check it out. Uh, I, I try and talk about some of these challenges in more detail and, and explain some of the things that I've talked about today. So uh, yeah, it's, it's been uh, it's been really fantastic um, sort of developing that I, those ideas with a bunch of people I've um, interviewed and got insights from. So yeah, if, you have, if you're interested, uh, feel free to check that out. Brilliant. Jamal, thank you so much. That was exactly what I had in mind, your magnificent book <laughs> on the AI in healthcare, right? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank um, you for having me. It's been really fun uh, talking with you, Joel. Brilliant. Thank, thank you for accepting the, the invite, Jamal. I'm going to uh, round up now. Uh, to all our viewers and listeners, uh, make sure you subscribe to the channel. As you can see, very valuable content here for you. Uh, also, I'm going to post uh, Janak's uh, links in here. Connect with him on LinkedIn and on social media. Also, I'm going to post a link to his uh, book. Make sure you ask him questions. He's a true AI expert. Um, also, let me acknowledge our uh, partners, Digital Health Platform, Clinic Touch V, and our industry partner, uh, Isaac Kerr, and I'll see you all next time.